Hello everyone, welcome back to the AI Academy, in the last lecture we have comprehensively looked into the NLP pipeline. Now, in this lecture, we will delve into the main components of NLTK library. The Natural Language Toolkit, commonly known as NLTK, is a comprehensive Python library designed for working with human language data. It provides a suite of tools and resources that make it easy to perform a wide range of natural language processing NLP, tasks, from basic text processing to advanced linguistic analysis. NLTK is widely used in both academia and industry due to its robust functionality and ease of use. So, let's start by getting everything set up and taking a look at some of the incredible resources NLTK offers. First things first, we need to install NLTK. If you haven't already, you'll want to make sure Python is installed on your computer. As NLTK works with Python, so this is a crucial step. It's a simple way to install NLTK, open your command prompt or terminal. And execute the command pip install NLTK. After installing NLTK, we need to download the data packages. NLTK comes with a built-in downloader that makes this easy. In your Python environment, you can use idle, Jupyter Notebook, or any other Python IDE, execute the command import NLTK and NLTK.download. This will open a downloader window where you can choose the datasets and packages to download. Select all and proceed. Now that NLTK is installed and ready to go, let's explore some of the corpora, that's just a fancy term for text collections, that come with it. These corpora are invaluable resources for NLP tasks. NLTK includes several famous corpora that you can use for practice and learning. Here's how you can access and read from some of these corpora. Let's first explore Gutenberg Corpus. The Gutenberg Corpus is a collection of texts sourced from Project Gutenberg, an extensive archive of free ebooks. It includes a wide range of literary works, spanning classic literature, historical documents, and more. This corpus is particularly valuable for linguistic and literary analysis, providing rich, diverse, and high-quality text data. It is widely used in natural language processing for tasks like language modeling, text analysis, and educational purposes. You can import Gutenberg from nltk.corpus library, additionally you can print the field's output. This command will list all the files available in the Gutenberg corpus. To read one of these texts, you can use Gutenberg. Words of Austinemma.txt and then print. This will print the first 100 words of Jane Austen's Emma. Next, we will look into Brown Corpus. The Brown Corpus is a meticulously compiled collection of text samples from diverse sources designed to represent the English language comprehensively. It includes texts from various genres such as news, fiction, and academic writing, providing a balanced linguistic dataset. This corpus is essential for linguistic research and natural language processing tasks, offering a rich resource for studying language usage and variation across different contexts. Its comprehensive nature makes it a valuable tool for developing and testing NLP models. As earlier same way you can import the text and print and verify some of the sample text. This command will list all the categories of texts available in the Brown corpus. To read from a specific category, and this will print the first 100 words from the news category. Next, we will look into the Reuters corpus. The Reuters corpus comprises thousands of news documents, making it an excellent resource for learning to handle and analyze news data. It includes articles on a wide range of topics, providing diverse and real-world examples of news text. This corpus is particularly valuable for training and evaluating text classification, information retrieval, and other NLP models. Its extensive coverage of news content helps in developing robust NLP applications tailored to the media and journalism industry. To use that you have to import Reuters module from the NLTK. Corpus also you can print Reuters.file IDs, this command will list all the files available in the Reuters corpus. To read one of these files you can print any one of them. 
This will print the first 100 words from a specific Reuters news document. By now, you should have attained a good grasp of how to install NLTK, download necessary data, and access some of the popular corpora. Playing around with these texts will give you a feel for the kind of data you'll be working with. Don't be afraid to explore different texts and see what interesting patterns you can find. Now that we've got NLTK up and running and have explored some of its corpora, it's time to dive into some fundamental text processing techniques. In this section, we'll cover tokenization and frequency distributions, which is essential tools in any NLP toolkit. Tokenization is the process of breaking down a piece of text into smaller units, like words or sentences. Think of it as slicing a loaf of bread, we take a whole text and cut it into manageable pieces. The tokenization can be used in two forms one for word and another for sentence. The word tokenization splits a text into individual words. This is often the first step in text analysis because many tasks, like frequency counting, require you to work with words separately. To illustrate with example, first we need to import the work tokenize module from the nltk.tokenize library. For tokenization we will use the example sentence, hello, world. This is a test sentence. The we will use the word underscore tokenize on the example sentence. In the output, notice that punctuation marks are treated as separate tokens. This is useful in many NLP applications where punctuation can be significant. Now we will look into the sentence tokenization, it splits a text into individual sentences. This can be particularly useful when you need to process or analyze text at the sentence level. First you need to import set underscore tokenize module from same nltk.tokenize. For this example, we will use the text, hello, world. This is a test sentence. NLTK makes text processing fun and easy. Then we apply sent underscore tokenize on text. In the output we can see that the text has been now transformed into sentences. By tokenizing text into sentences, you can handle each sentence independently, which can be beneficial for tasks like sentiment analysis or translation. Let us now discuss about frequency distributions. Once you've tokenized your text, you might want to know how often each word appears. This is where frequency distributions come into play. They help you understand the frequency of different words in a text, which can reveal interesting patterns and insights. The NLTK provides a handy tool called Frequency DST for computing frequency distributions of words. Let's see it in action, we have to execute the syntax from NLTK.probability import frequency DST. Next create a words variable assign at the word underscore tokenize function with sample text as, this is a test. This test is only a test, then create FDST variable and assign it frequency DST of words variable. Suppose, if we print, fdst.most underscore common, 3, in this code frequency dst, frequency distribution, object is used to find and print the three most common items in the data along with their counts. The output indicates that. The word test appears three times. The words this and is each appear two times. In simple terms, this code shows you the top three most frequent words in the data and how often they occur. Here, test is the most common word, followed by this and is, both of which are equally frequent. This simple analysis can be powerful in understanding the dominant themes or identifying stop words in a text. Let us now plot the frequency distributions, NLTK allows you to plot these distributions using Matplotlib, a popular plotting library. Here's how you can plot the frequency distribution of the most common words. First import matplotlib.pyplot as plt, then use the command, fdst.plot, 30, cumulative equals false, and in last run the syntax plt.show. The graph plots the frequency distribution plot created using matplotlib, showing the counts of different words from a text. The x-axis, samples the x-axis represents different words, or tokens, from the text sample. 
The words shown here are, test, this, is, a, dot, and only. And the y-axis, counts the y-axis shows the frequency, count, of each word in the text sample. The word test appears three times in the text. The word this appears two times. The word is appearing two times. The word a appears two times. The period dot appears two times. The word only appears one time. Test is the most frequent word, appearing three times. Other frequent words, this, is, a, and dot each appear two times. Least frequent word, only, appears only once. Now that we've covered the basics of text processing, it's time to move on to some simple statistics with language data. This will help you understand how to quantify and analyze text data, starting with frequency distributions. The frequency distributions are a fundamental concept in NLP. They help you see how often different words or patterns occur in your text data, which can be incredibly insightful for various analysis tasks. Next, we will look into the conditional frequency distributions. Sometimes, you might want to analyze word frequencies based on specific conditions. For instance, you might be interested in how often certain words appear in different genres or contexts. This is where conditional frequency distributions come into play. To illustrate we're using the Brown corpus from the NLTK library and creating a conditional frequency distribution, CFD, to analyze word frequencies within specific genres. So first we import the Brown corpus and the conditional frequency DST class from NLTK. The Brown corpus is a collection of texts from various genres, and conditional frequency DST helps us count the frequency of words under different conditions. In the next part of the code, we create a CFD. First, we specify two genres, news and romance. Then for each genre, we iterate over all words in that genre's text using brown.words, categories equals genre. Next, we pair each word with its genre, creating pairs like news and government and romance and love. And in the last we are counting how many times each word appears in each genre. Finally, we print the frequency of the word government in the news genre and the word love in the romance genre. The word government appears 52 times in the news category of the brown corpus. And the word love appears 32 times in the romance category of the brown corpus. Next look into an example in which we will show how to compare the usage of modal verbs across different genres in the brown corpus and plot the results. We will compare the usage of modal verbs like can, could, may, might, must, shall, should, will, and would across various genres in the brown corpus. This will help us understand how the usage of these verbs varies in different contexts. First, we import the NLTK library to access the Brown corpus and conditional frequency distribution and matplotlib for plotting. Then we define genres and modal array. We specify the genres we want to analyze and the modal verbs we are interested in. So, this code constructs a conditional frequency distribution, CFD it iterates over each genre in our specified list. For each genre, it iterates over all words in the brown corpus that belong to that genre. It pairs each word with its genre, but only if the word is a modal verb, as specified in our modals list. And then we plot the CFD using matplotlib. In the output the graph shows the frequency of modal verbs, can, could, may, might, must, shall, should, will, and would, across different genres in the brown corpus. Each line represents a different genre. The x-axis lists the modal verbs we are analyzing like can, could, may, might, must, shall, should, will, and would. The y-axis shows the frequency count of each modal verb in the text. In summary we can observe that the news genre often has higher usage of modals like may, must, shall, should, will, and would, indicating frequent use of definitive statements and future tenses. The romance genre shows higher usage of modals like could, might, and would, 
reflecting hypothetical and conditional scenarios. The hobbies genre frequently uses, can, suggesting practical instructions and abilities. The religion genre has relatively balanced usage of various modals, often associated with formal and directive language. The science underscore fiction and humor genres generally have lower usage of these modals. By comparing the frequency of these modal verbs, we can see distinct patterns in how different genres use language to convey different types of information and emotions. We'll now explore two crucial aspects of text analysis, measuring lexical diversity and counting words. These techniques help us understand the richness of a text and the frequency of specific words. So, the lexical diversity is a measure of how varied the vocabulary is in a text. A text with high lexical diversity uses a wide range of words, while a text with low lexical diversity uses the same words repeatedly. One way to measure this is by calculating the type token ratio, TTR. The TTR is a measure of lexical diversity, which indicates how many different words are used in a text relative to the total number of words. A higher TTR suggests more variety in word usage. Here, we import the word underscore tokenize function from the NLTK library, which will help us break down the text into individual words, tokens. Then we are defining the sample text. Next the word underscore tokenize function splits the sentence into individual words. So, our tokens will be, natural, language, processing, with, python, is, fun, dot, python, is, also, very, powerful, dot. Next, number underscore tokens counts the total number of words, which includes repetitions of tokens. In our example, number underscore tokens is 14. And the number underscore types counts the unique words by converting the list of tokens into a set, which removes duplicates. In our example, number underscore types is 11. Then the TTR is calculated by dividing the number of unique words by the total number of words. For our text, it is 0.79. The type token ratio of 0.79 means that approximately 79% of the words in the sample text are unique. This indicates a relatively high level of lexical diversity for this short text. This tells us that our sentence has a good variety of words, making it quite diverse. Moving ahead we will look into counting words and other tokens, so counting words and other tokens in a text is a fundamental step in text analysis. It helps you understand which words are most frequent and can highlight important themes or topics in the text. Python's collections module provides a convenient tool called counter for this purpose. The counter class from the collections module is perfect for counting occurrences of elements in a list. Let's see it in action with a practical example. So, first we import the counter class from the collections module. Counter module is a handy tool for counting hashable objects like words in a text. In this case also we will be using the same sample text as the previous one. As earlier we used the word underscore tokenize function to split the sentence into individual words or tokens. Next we use the counter class which counts the frequency of each token in the list. It creates a dictionary where the keys are the tokens and the values are their respective counts. The output shows the count of each word in the text. The words, python, is, and the period, dot, each appear twice. All other words appear once. And in the other print statement when we ask for the top three most common words, it tells us that, python, is, and, dot, are the most frequent, each showing up twice. Let's now analyze a more substantial text to see how these techniques can be applied to real-world data. We'll use the NLTK Gutenberg corpus and analyze the lexical diversity and word frequencies of Jane Austen's Emma. And we'll calculate the type token ratio, TTR, and the frequencies of the most common words in the text. So, First we import the Gutenberg corpus from NLTK and the counter class from the collections module. Then we load the words from Jane Austen's Emma into a list called Emma. Next, we calculate the TTR by dividing the number of unique words by the total number of words. 
and in last we print the TTR formatted to two decimal places. In the next code, the counter class counts the frequency of each word in the text. The syntax word underscore counts dot most underscore common, 10, returns the 10 most common words and their counts. The TTR for Emma is 0.04, meaning that only 4% of the words are unique. This indicates a lot of repetition, which is common in literary texts where function words like the, and, and, to, are used frequently. The most common words include punctuation marks like commas and periods, which appear very frequently. The most common actual words are typical function words, to, the, and, of, I, a, was, and, her. These words are essential for sentence structure and are used very often in English. This kind of analysis helps us understand the text structure and the author's writing style. Next, we're going to explore collocations and bigrams, the two powerful concepts in text analysis that help us understand which words tend to appear together. These techniques are especially useful for identifying common phrases and understanding the structure of language. The bigrams are simply pairs of consecutive words in a text. They can reveal interesting patterns and relationships between words. For instance, in the sentence, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, the bigrams are, the, quick, quick, brown, and so on. NLTK makes it easy to find bigrams with the bigrams function. Let's look at an example. So, first we import the bigrams function and the word underscore tokenize function from the NLTK library. We have a simple sample sentence about a fox and a dog. Next we use the word underscore tokenize function to split the sentence into individual words or called as tokens. Then we use the bigrams function to generate the pairs of consecutive words from the list of tokens. We convert this into a list and store it in bigrams underscore list. The output is a list of tuples, where each tuple contains a pair of consecutive words from the original sentence. It's like seeing the text through a series of word pairs, giving us insights into its structure. Next, we will look into using collocations methods, the collocations are pairs of words that appear together more frequently than would be expected by chance. NLTK provides specialized methods for finding collocations, which can be more sophisticated than simple bigrams. These methods often use statistical measures to identify significant word pairs. So, to illustrate, first, we import the bigram collocation finder and bigram association measures from NLTK. These tools help us find and measure the significance of bigrams or the word pairs in a text. We will use the same sample text as in previous example. Next as we know already we will use the word underscore tokenize function to split the text into individual words. Then we will use bigram collocation finder from words of tokens to create a finder object that looks for bigrams in the tokenized text. And we will also use bigram underscore finder dot and best of bigram association measures dot likelihood underscore ratio 10, which finds the top 10 bigrams based on their likelihood ratio, which is a measure of how often they occur together relative to how often they would be expected to occur by chance. The output is a list of tuples, where each tuple contains a pair of words that frequently appear together in the text. So, in our in our text, the quick appears frequently, as does fox jumps, lazy dog, and blue fox. These pairs, or collocations, help us see the significant word combinations in the text. It's like finding the most common duos in a story, which can be very useful for understanding language patterns and relationships in the text. The bigrams and collocations have numerous applications in text analysis. By understanding common word pairs, search engines can improve their ability to interpret user queries. For instance, recognizing that New York is a common bigram helps the search engine understand that these words should be treated together. Bigrams can enhance sentiment analysis by capturing phrases like not good or very happy, which provide more context than single words. In translation tasks, recognizing collocations helps maintain the meaning and natural flow of language across translations. 
and identifying key bigrams can aid in extracting important information and summarizing text effectively. Let's now analyze a more substantial text to see how we can use bigrams and collocations in practice. We'll use a sample text from the NLTK Gutenberg corpus. So, in the below code we are using NLTK to find the most significant bigrams and trigrams in Jane Austen's novel, Emma. Bigrams are pairs of consecutive words, while trigrams are sequences of three consecutive words. We are using measures like the likelihood ratio to determine the significance of these word pairs and triplets. So, first we import the necessary components from NLTK to find and measure the significance of bigrams and trigrams. Then we load the words from Jane Austen's Emma into a list called Emma. Then we are using bigram collocation finder dot from underscore words of Emma to create a finder object that looks for bigrams in the tokenized text. Next syntax bigram underscore finder best of bigram association measures dot likelihood underscore ratio 10 finds the top 10 bigrams based on their likelihood ratio. In the next section of the code we are using trigram collocation finder dot from underscore words of Emma to create a finder object that looks for trigrams in the tokenized text. And then the trigram underscore finder and best trigram association measures dot likelihood underscore ratio 10 finds the top 10 trigrams based on their likelihood ratio. So, in the output we can see that the most significant bigrams in Emma include pairs like single quote s Mr. Dot, and dot, double quotes. And these pairs often reflect common punctuation patterns and frequent word combinations in the text. And for the trigrams, the most significant trigrams often include possessive forms, such as Harriet, single quote, S, and Elton, single quote, S. And these trigrams highlight how characters' names are frequently mentioned with possessive forms in the novel. By analyzing these bigrams and trigrams, we get a better understanding of the language and patterns used in Emma. It's like uncovering the most frequently used word combinations in the book, giving us a deeper look into its linguistic style. Let us now move on to explore two powerful techniques for analyzing text, the dispersion plots and concordances. These tools help us visualize and understand the usage patterns of words within a text, providing deeper insights into its structure and themes. A dispersion plot is a visual representation that shows the occurrence of words across the span of a text. It helps us see how often and where specific words appear, giving us a sense of their distribution and prominence. Let's create a dispersion plot using the NLTK library. We'll use a sample text from the NLTK Gutenberg corpus, specifically Jane Austen's Emma. This code generates a lexical dispersion plot for specific words in Jane Austen's novel, Emma. A lexical dispersion plot shows where specific words appear throughout a text, giving a visual representation of their distribution. Here, we import matplotlib.pyplot for plotting, Gutenberg from NLTK to load the text, and dispersion underscore plot to create the plot. Next, we load the words from Jane Austen's Emma into a list called Emma. Then we specify the target words we want to track in the plot. These are key characters in the novel. Next the syntax, dispersion underscore plot of Emma, target underscore words generates the dispersion plot for the specified words. The resulting plot shows the distribution of the specified words such as Emma, Frank, Jane, Knightley, Harriet across the text of Emma. The x-axis represents the position of the words in the text, starting from the beginning and moving to the end. The numbers indicate the position within the text. The y-axis lists the target words being tracked such as Emma, Frank, Jane, Knightley, and Harriet. And each blue dot represents an occurrence of the corresponding word at a specific point in the text. Analysis of the plot is that the character Emma appears frequently and is distributed fairly evenly throughout the entire text. Frank appears sporadically, with noticeable gaps between his mentions. Jane also appears sporadically, with several clusters of mentions. Knightley appears consistently throughout the text but less frequently than Emma. And the Harriet is mentioned frequently, 
with her mentions distributed across the text. This visual tool helps us understand the structure of the novel and the prominence of different characters in a clear and intuitive way. For example, if a character's name appears frequently throughout the plot, it indicates that the character plays a significant role. Conversely, if a name appears sporadically, it suggests a minor role. Let's now discuss concordances and similar words. A concordance shows every occurrence of a word in a text, along with a few words of context. This is useful for understanding how a word is used and the various contexts in which it appears. Let's find concordances for the word Emma in Jane Austen's Emma. The code below finds and displays the concordances for the word Emma in Jane Austen's novel Emma. A concordance shows the word in context, highlighting its occurrences along with the surrounding text. So, first we import the text class from NLTK, which helps us work with the text as a whole and find concordances. Then we create a text object from the tokenized words of Emma. This allows us to use various text analysis methods provided by NLTK. The syntax Emma underscore text dot concordance of Emma finds and displays the concordances for the word Emma. It shows occurrences of the word along with a few words before and after it, providing context for each instance. The output shows that the word Emma appears 865 times in the novel. Each snippet provides context, so you can see how Emma fits into different sentences and passages. For example, Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and others shows us part of a sentence introducing the main character. This tool is incredibly useful for understanding how often key terms are used and how they contribute to the text's overall meaning and style. Next, we look into using the similar method which finds words that appear in similar contexts to a given word. This can be useful for discovering synonyms or understanding how different words are used in similar ways. Let's find words that are used in similar contexts to Emma in the text. This line finds and displays words that appear in similar contexts to the word Emma. The function looks at the surrounding words, context, where Emma appears and finds other words that occur in those contexts. The output shows a list of words that are used in similar contexts to Emma. In the output the words like she, it, he, I, you, her, him, me, they, them, and herself are pronouns. These are commonly used in contexts where a person's name appears, often as subjects or objects in sentences. And the Harriet, Jane, and Isabella are other characters in the novel, suggesting they appear in similar narrative contexts as Emma. Also, words like and, that, all, but, and, there are conjunctions or determiners that commonly structure sentences where character names appear. By understanding this, you get a better sense of the text structure and how different characters and elements are interrelated within the story. It highlights the frequent mention of characters and pronouns in similar narrative roles as Emma. Let's now combine these techniques to analyze a text corpus. We'll look at Moby Dick by Herman Melville text, examining the usage of the words whale and sea. This code snippet analyses Herman Melville's Moby Dick to examine the usage of specific words. It creates a lexical dispersion plot for the words whale, sea, ship, captain, and Ahab, finds concordances for the word whale, and identifies words used in similar contexts to whale. First, we import the necessary libraries to bring in functions for loading texts, analyzing text contexts, and creating plots. Next, we load the text of Moby Dick and create an NLTK text object from the tokenized words, making it easier to perform various analyses. We specify the words we are interested in tracking within the text in our case they are whale, sea, ship, captain, and Ahab. The syntax dispersion underscore plot of Moby underscore Dick, target underscore words generates the dispersion plot for the specified words. And the line Moby underscore text dot concordance of whale finds and displays the contexts in which the word whale appears in the text. 
and the mobi underscore text dot similar of whale line identifies words that appear in contexts similar to those of a whale. The dispersion plot visually shows where specific words appear throughout the text of Moby Dick. The x-axis indicates the position of the words within the text. The y-axis lists the target words being tracked such as whale, sea, ship, captain, and Ahab. And the blue dots represents an occurrence of the corresponding word at a specific point in the text. From the plot we can see that whale is mentioned frequently throughout the text. The C is also mentioned frequently, indicating a consistent presence of maritime themes. And the word ship, similar to whale and sea, it appears regularly. Captain, appears sporadically. And Ahab, is mentioned consistently but less frequently than whale, sea, and ship. And from the concordances for whale, the output shows 25 of the 1226 instances where whale appears, providing context for each occurrence. This helps understand how whale is used within sentences throughout the novel. Lastly, we identify other words that appear in similar contexts to whale. This list includes words like ship, sea, and captain, showing that these words are often used in similar ways within the text. By examining these elements, we get a deeper understanding of the thematic focus and character mentions in Moby Dick, enriching our appreciation of Melville's writing. Next, we'll revisit some essential Python programming concepts that will help you make decisions and control the flow of your programs. These skills are crucial for writing effective and efficient code, especially when processing and analyzing text. So, first we'll cover conditional statements and looping structures. These are fundamental building blocks in Python that allow you to control the execution of your code based on certain conditions and repeat actions multiple times. Next, we will look into the conditional statements. The conditional statements allow you to execute different blocks of code based on certain conditions. The basic structure involves if, elif, and else. The if statement checks a condition and executes a block of code if the condition is true. The elif, short for, else if, statement checks another condition if the previous if or elif was false. The else statement executes a block of code if none of the previous conditions were true. Here's a simple example. First, we set a variable called temperature to 20. The if statement first checks if the temperature is greater than 30. If this condition is true, it prints, it's a hot day, and skips the rest of the conditions. However, since our temperature is set to 20, this condition is false. Then the elif statement checks if the temperature is greater than 20. If this condition is true, it prints, it's a warm day, and skips the rest. But since our temperature is exactly 20, this condition is also false. And in the last if none of the above conditions are true, the else block executes. Since the temperature is not greater than 30 and not greater than 20, this block runs and prints, it's a cool day. Next, we will look into looping structures, the loops allow you to repeat a block of code multiple times. Python provides two types of loops, for and while. A for loop iterates over a sequence, like a list, tuple, or string, and executes a block of code for each element in the sequence. In this example we create a list called fruits that contains three items, apple, banana, and cherry. This list is a collection of fruit names. Then we define a for loop, which iterates over each item in the fruits list, the loop starts with the first item in the list. For each item in the list, the loop assigns the item to the variable fruit and executes the code inside the loop. The code inside the loop prints the current value of fruit. This way, you efficiently print all the items in your list with just a few lines of code. The output shows each fruit on a new line, just as you intended. Next, we will look into the while loops, a while loop repeats a block of code as long as a specified condition is true. In this example we start by setting a variable called count to 1. This variable will keep track of the number of times we've looped so far. This is a while loop which will continue to execute as long as the condition of count less than or equals 5 is true, 
at the beginning of each loop iteration, the condition count less than or equals 5 is checked. If the condition is true, the code inside the loop runs, which prints the current value of count. The count plus equals 1 statement increases the value of count by 1 after each iteration. In this case, you start at 1, print it, go to 2, print it, and continue this process until you print 5. Once the count becomes 6, the loop stops because the condition, count equals 5, is no longer true. So, the loop helps you efficiently print the numbers 1 through 5 in order. Next, we will look into loop control the break and continue, the break statement terminates the loop prematurely, and the continue statement skips the rest of the code inside the loop for the current iteration and moves to the next iteration. So, in this example we start a for loop that iterates over a range of numbers from 1 to 10. The range of 1, 11 function generates numbers starting from 1 up to, but not including, 11. Inside the loop, we have an if statement that checks if the current number is equal to 5. If it is, the break statement is executed, which immediately stops the loop. If the if condition is not met, the current number is printed. This happens for each iteration until the loop is broken. In the fifth iteration the if condition number equals 5 is true. The break statement is executed, stopping the loop immediately. So basically, the loop starts with 1, checks if it's 5 and if it's not, and prints 1. It moves to 2, checks if it's 5 and if it's not, and prints 2. It continues with 3 and 4, printing each number. And when it reaches 5, it sees the condition is met and breaks out of the loop, stopping further printing. Here's an example of using continue, so in this case also we start a for loop that iterates over a range of numbers from 1 to 10, inclusive. The range, 1, 11, function generates numbers starting from 1 up to, but not including, 11. Inside the loop, we have an if statement that checks if the current number is equal to 5. If it is, the continue statement is executed. The continue statement tells the loop to skip the rest of the code inside the loop for the current iteration and move on to the next iteration. If the if condition is not met, the current number is printed. This happens for each iteration unless the loop is instructed to continue. When it reaches 5, it sees the condition is met and skips the print statement, moving directly to the next number. It then continues with 6 through 10, printing each of these numbers. So, you get the numbers 1 through 4 and 6 through 10 printed, but 5 is skipped. Let us now look into the practical example of processing text with loops and conditionals, suppose we want to analyze a text and count the occurrences of words longer than a certain length, excluding common stop words. So, in this example, first we import the stop words and word underscore tokenize functions from the NLTK library. The stop words are common words, like, the, is, in, that are often filtered out in text processing. Then we define the sample text. This text contains a mix of short and long words. Next, we tokenize the text, the word underscore tokenize is used to split text into individual words tokens. And, we define stop underscore words as a set of common English stop words. And we also set a threshold underscore length of 4, meaning we are interested in words longer than 4 characters. Then we initialize a counter variable long underscore word underscore count to keep track of words longer than the threshold length. Next, we define the logic for loop through the tokens. The loop goes through each token in the list. The if token dot lower in stop underscore word statement checks if the token converted to lowercase is a stop word. If it is, the continue statement skips the rest of the loop for that token. And the if len of token threshold underscore length statement checks if the length of the token is greater than the threshold length. If it is, the counter long underscore word underscore count is increment by one. This line prints the total count of words longer than the threshold length, excluding stop words. So, after processing all the tokens, we find that there are 5 words longer than 4 characters, excluding stop words. 
The output of the code tells us exactly this. There are five such words in the sample text. Next, we will be diving into two other crucial aspects of Python programming, functions and modules. Understanding these concepts will help you write more organized, reusable, and efficient code. Let's explore how to define and use functions, and how to leverage Python modules, including NLTK and other libraries. So, the functions are reusable blocks of code that perform a specific task. They help you avoid repeating code and make your programs easier to understand and maintain. To define a function, you use the def keyword, followed by the function name and parentheses. Inside the parentheses, you can specify parameters that the function will accept. The function can then return a value using the return keyword. In the example the code defines a function named greet that takes one parameter name. The function returns a string that incorporates the name parameter into a greeting message using an f string, f hello, name. The function greet is called with the argument Alice. The return value of the function call is the string hello, Alice. Let's now look at a more complex example where we define a function to calculate the average word length in a text. In this example first we import the word underscore tokenize function from the NLTK library, which is used to split the text into individual words. Then we define a function average underscore word underscore length that takes a parameter text. The syntax tokens equals word underscore tokenize of text, tokenizes the input text into a list of words. Total underscore length equals sum, len of word, for word in tokens calculates the total length of all words by iterating over each word in the tokens list and summing their lengths. And in the last return total underscore length slash len, tokens returns the average word length by dividing the total length by the number of tokens. Average word length, for shows the average word length of the given sample text, calculated correctly using the average underscore word underscore length function. In this example, the average underscore word underscore length function tokenizes the input text, calculates the total length of all words, and returns the average length. Let's take a practical example of text analysis with functions and modules where we'll define a function to analyze a text, count word frequencies, and plot the most common words. In this example first we import the libraries, so, import NLTK, imports the natural language toolkit, NLTK, library. From nltk.tokenize import word underscore tokenize, imports the word underscore tokenize function from nltk to split text into words. From collections import counter, imports the counter class from the collections module to count the frequency of words. Import matplotlib.pyplot as plt, imports the matplotlib.pyplot for plotting the data. Def analyze underscore text of text, defines a function analyze underscore text that takes a parameter text. Tokens equals word underscore token easy off text tokenizes the input text into a list of words. Word underscore counts equals counter of tokens, uses counter to count the frequency of each word in the list of tokens. Most underscore common underscore words equals word underscore counts dot most underscore common, 10 retrieves the 10 most common words and their counts. Print, most underscore common underscore words prints the most common words and their counts. Words, counts equals zip of most underscore common underscore words, unzips the most common words and their counts into separate tuples words and counts. plt.bar of words, counts creates a bar plot of the most common words. Next, we will look into the part of speech tagging, the part of speech tagging involves labeling each word in a sentence with its appropriate part of speech, such as noun, verb, adjective, etc. This process is crucial for many NLP tasks, including parsing, named entity recognition, and sentiment analysis. The POS tagging is important because it provides valuable information about the grammatical structure of a sentence. For example, Knowing whether a word is a noun or a verb can help in understanding the meaning of the sentence. It is also a stepping stone for more advanced NLP tasks. Consider the sentence, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. POS tagging helps us identify that quick and brown are adjectives, fox is a noun, 
and jumps is a verb. This grammatical information is essential for tasks like parsing and semantic analysis. NLTK provides a simple and efficient way to perform POS tagging. Let's see how to use it. So, in this example along with other NLTK library, we import the POS underscore tag function from NLTK to perform part of speech tagging. Next, we define a sample sentence to be analyzed. And we use word underscore tokenize to split the sample sentence into a list of words. Then we use the POS underscore tag to assign part of speech tags to each token in the list. POS tagging is the process of marking up a word in a text as corresponding to a particular part of speech, based on both its definition and its context. In the output the, is tagged as a determiner, quick, is tagged as an adjective, brown, is tagged as an adjective, fox, is tagged as a noun, jumps, is tagged as a verb, and third person singular present, over, is tagged as a preposition, lazy, is tagged as an adjective and the dog, is tagged as a noun. The NLTK provides several corpora that are already POS tagged, which you can use for practice and analysis. Let's explore the brown corpus, which contains texts from various genres. So, in this example we first import the brown corpus from the Natural Language Toolkit. The brown corpus is a collection of text samples from a wide range of sources, categorized by genre. Then we retrieve the words from the a news category of the brown corpus along with their part of speech tags. This creates a list of tuples, where each tuple contains a word and its corresponding POS tag. And prints the first 10 tagged words from the list. This provides a sample of the words and their tags. So in the output, the is tagged as an article, Fulton is tagged as a proper noun, part of a title, County is tagged as a noun, part of a title, grand is tagged as an adjective, part of a title, jury is tagged as a noun, part of a title, said is tagged as a verb, past tense, Friday is tagged as an adverbial noun, and is tagged as an article, investigation is tagged as a noun, and the of is tagged as a preposition. The tags indicate the grammatical role of each word in its context, which is useful for various natural language processing tasks, including parsing, syntactic analysis, and language modeling. Let us now explore about the named entity recognition the NR, it is a fascinating and powerful NLP technique. The named entity recognition is the process of identifying and classifying entities in text into predefined categories such as names of persons, organizations, locations, expressions of times, quantities, monetary values, percentages, and more. NER is crucial for many NLP applications, including information extraction, question answering, and summarization. For instance, in the sentence, Barack Obama was born in Hawaii and served as the 44th President of the United States, the NER would identify Barack Obama as a person, Hawaii as a location, and the 44th President of the United States as a title. The NLTK provides a built-in NR tagger that we can use to recognize named entities in text. Let's see how to use it with some practical examples. Let's now look into our example to process a larger text and extract named entities from it. We'll use a sample text from the NLTK Gutenberg corpus. So, first we will be importing the required libraries, from NLTK.corpus import Gutenberg. From nltk.tokenize import sent underscore tokenize, word underscore tokenize, imports functions for sentence and word tokenization. From nltk.tag import pos underscore tag, imports the function for part of speech tagging. From nltk.chunk import any underscore chunk, imports the function for named entity chunking. Next, we will be loading and tokenizing text, the syntax sample underscore text equals gutenberg.raw, austinemma.txt loads the raw text of Emma by Jane Austen from the Gutenberg corpus. Sentences equals sent underscore tokenize, sample underscore text splits the text into sentences. Then we will define the function to extract named entities, def extract underscore named underscore entities, 
sentences, defines a function to extract named entities from a list of sentences. Named underscore entities equals, initializes an empty list to store named entities. For sentence in sentences, 10, limits the extraction to the first 10 sentences for brevity. Tokens equals word underscore tokenize, sentence tokenizes each sentence into words. Tagged underscore tokens equals POS underscore tag, tokens performs POS tagging on the tokens, chunked underscore tokens equals any underscore chunk, tagged underscore tokens performs named entity chunking on the tagged tokens. If has a chunk, label, checks if the chunk has a label, indicating it is a named entity. Named underscore entities dot append, dot join, C, zero, for C in chunk, joins the tokens of the named entity and adds it to the list. And then we will be extracting and printing named entities, entities equals extract underscore named underscore entities, sentences extracts named entities from the tokenized sentences. Print, entities prints the list of extracted named entities. And the output indicates the proper names identified within the text, such as Emma, Jane Austen, and Miss Taylor. Note that the exact entities will depend on the content of the first 10 sentences in the text. Let's take it a step further by classifying the extracted named entities into different categories. In this example, we define the function to extract and classify named entities, the def classify underscore named underscore entities, sentences, defines a function to extract and classify named entities from a list of sentences. The classified underscore entities equals person, organization, GPE, date, other, initializes a dictionary to store classified entities under different categories, person, organization, GPE, geopolitical entity, date, and other. For sentence in sentences, 10, colon, limits the extraction to the first 10 sentences for brevity. The tokens equals word underscore tokenize, sentence tokenizes each sentence into words. Tagged underscore tokens equals POS underscore tag, tokens performs POS tagging on the tokens. Chunked underscore tokens equals any underscore chunk, tagged underscore tokens performs a named entity chunking on the tagged tokens. If has a chunk label, checks if the chunk has a label, indicating it is a named entity. Label equals chunk dot label, retrieves the label of the named entity, such as person, GPE. Entity equals dot join, C, zero, for C in chunk joins the tokens of the named entity into a single string. If label in classified underscore entities, checks if the label is in the dictionary. Classified underscore entities, label, dot append, entity adds the entity to the appropriate category in the dictionary. Else, classified underscore entities, other, dot append, entity if the label is not in the dictionary, adds the entity to the other category. Next step will be of classifying and printing named entities, classified underscore entities equals classify underscore named underscore entities, sentences extracts and classifies named entities from the tokenized sentences. For label, entities in classified underscore entities dot items, iterates over the dictionary items. Print, F, label, entities, a prints the classified named entities under each category. The function processes the first 10 sentences of the text and classifies named entities into predefined categories. So, in the output no entities were classified under person. No entities were classified under organization. GPE, geopolitical entity the entities, Emma, twice, and sorrow, were classified under GPE. No entities were classified under date. Several entities, including Jane Austen, Emma Woodhouse, Miss Taylor, Mr. Woodhouse, and others, were classified under other. This might be due to limitations in the named entity recognition model or the nature of the text. This output demonstrates how named entities can be extracted and classified from text, providing a structured view of key terms and their categories within the document. This classification can be useful for further analysis or information extraction tasks. Next, we're diving into parsing and syntax trees, which are essential for understanding the grammatical structure of sentences. 
Parsing helps us break down sentences into their constituent parts, revealing the underlying syntax. We'll explore constituency and dependency parsing, and how to use NLTK for parsing with practical examples. The syntax trees are visual representations of the grammatical structure of sentences. They show how words in a sentence are grouped together into phrases and how these phrases are related. There are two main types of parsing. First one is constituency parsing. This type of parsing breaks down a sentence into nested phrases that form a hierarchical tree structure. And the second one is dependency parsing. This type of parsing focuses on the relationships between words, showing which words are dependent on others. The constituency parsing divides a sentence into subphrases, each belonging to different grammatical categories. For example, in the sentence, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, we can identify the noun phrases, the quick brown fox, and the verb phrases, jumps over the lazy dog. Dependency parsing, on the other hand, focuses on the dependencies between words. It shows how words in a sentence are connected based on their grammatical roles. For instance, in the same sentence, jumps would be the root verb, and fox would be its subject. NLTK provides tools for both constituency and dependency parsing. Let us now take a practical example of parsing a text corpus. For this we'll use a sample text from the NLTK Gutenberg corpus and perform constituency parsing on the first sentence. So, the example code demonstrates how to parse and chunk text from a corpus using NLTK. It loads a text, tokenizes it, performs part-of-speech tagging, and then uses chunking to identify noun phrases. Finally, it prints the chunk tree and converts it to the IOB format. As a first step we import the necessary libraries such as, Gutenberg, which provides access to the Gutenberg corpus. Sent underscore tokenize, splits text into sentences. Word underscore tokenize, splits sentences into words, tokens. POS underscore tag, tags tokens with their part of speech. The conl tags to tree and tree to conl tags functions to convert between chunk trees and IOB format. Then we load the raw text of Emma by Jane Austen from the Gutenberg corpus. Next, we splits the entire text into individual sentences. Then we select the first sentence from the tokenized sentences. Tokenizes this sentence into words and tags each token with its part of speech. Then we defines a grammar rule for noun phrases, which can optionally start with a determiner, followed by any number of adjectives, and ending with a noun. CP equals NLTK dot rejects parser of grammar creates a chunk parser using the defined grammar. Tree equals CP parse of tagged underscore tokens, uses the chunk parser to parse the tagged tokens and create a chunk tree. IOB underscore tags equals tree to conl tags of tree print of IOB underscore tags. Converts the chunk tree to IOB short form of inside outside beginning format, which is commonly used for representing chunk text. The parse tree shows the structure of the first sentence, identifying noun phrases and other syntactic components. The IOB tags provide a linear representation of the chunking, where O indicates tokens outside any chunk. BNP indicates the beginning of a noun phrase. INP indicates the continuation of a noun phrase. This process helps in understanding the structure of the text and identifying meaningful chunks, such as noun phrases, which can be useful in various NLP tasks. Now we are we're going to look into lexical resources, focusing on WordNet, a powerful tool for understanding word relationships. We'll explore how to use WordNet in NLTK to find synonyms, antonyms, hypernyms, and other lexical relationships. These skills will be invaluable for tasks like word sense disambiguation, text analysis, and more, such as, WordNet is a lexical database of the English language that groups words into sets of synonyms called synsets. Each synset represents a specific concept, and the synsets are connected by various relationships like synonymy, antonymy, hypernomy, and hyponymy. 
WordNet is an essential resource for many NLP tasks because it provides rich semantic information about words and their relationships. NLTK provides easy access to WordNet, allowing us to explore these relationships programmatically. Let's start with a basic example to see how we can use WordNet in NLTK. So, in this example also, as usual first we import WordNet from the NLTK corpus module. This allows us to use WordNet's functionalities to explore words and their meanings. Next, the wn.synsets of dog function returns a list of synsets, sets of cognitive synonyms, for the word dog. Each synset represents a different meaning of the word. And the print, synsets, displays these synsets. In this case, it shows all the different meanings associated with the word dog. Then this loop iterates through each synset in the list. For each synset, it prints the name and the definition using synset.name and synset.definition. In the output, you ask WordNet to give you all the meanings of dog. And it comes back with several results. The most common domesticated animal that many people have is pets. A slang term for a man. A term for someone who is morally bad. Even meanings that don't directly relate to the animal, like Frank, a type of sausage, or Chase, to pursue something. For each meaning, WordNet provides a brief definition to help you understand the context in which that meaning is used. This way, you get a comprehensive view of all the different ways dog can be understood in English. The WordNet also allows us to explore various lexical relationships, including synonyms, words with similar meanings, antonyms, words with opposite meanings, and hypernyms, more general terms. Let's look at some practical examples to explore these relationships. To find synonyms of a word, we can use the lemmas of its synsets. Lemmas are the base forms of words. In the output we get the synonyms of happy, felicitous, glad, happy, etc. To find antonyms, we look for lemmas with the antonyms method. The output is antonyms of happy which is unhappy. The hypernyms are more general terms. For example, a hypernym of dog is canine, and a hypernym of canine is animal. And in the output the hypernyms of dog is the domestic animal. Or any of various fissiped mammals with non-retractal claws and typically long muzzles or any of various animals that have been tamed and made fit for a human environment. So, in this lecture, we delved into the main components of the NLTK library, which is a powerful toolkit for working with human language data in Python. We started by setting up NLTK, installing the necessary packages, and exploring some of its valuable corpora like Gutenberg, Brown, and Reuters. These corpora provided us with rich text data for various NLP tasks. We covered fundamental text processing techniques, including tokenization, where we learned how to break down text into words and sentences. We also explored frequency distributions to understand word occurrences in texts. Through practical examples, we saw how to use frequency DST to compute and plot word frequencies. Moving forward, we examined conditional frequency distributions to analyze word usage across different genres using the Brown corpus. This technique helped us uncover patterns in how different words are used in various contexts. Next, we discussed lexical diversity in counting words, which are crucial for understanding the richness and variety of a text. We learned how to calculate the type token ratio, TTR, and use the counter class to count word frequencies. We then explored collocations and bigrams, which helped us identify common word pairs and significant word combinations in texts. Using bigrams and bigram collocation finder, we analyzed texts to find frequently occurring word pairs. Additionally, we created lexical dispersion plots to visualize the distribution of words across a text and used concordances to see how words are used in different contexts. We also explored finding similar words to understand the context in which specific words are used. In the next lecture, we will start exploring to process the raw text. The goal of this chapter is to answer the following questions. 
How can we write programs to access text from local files and from the web, in order to get hold of an unlimited range of language material? How can we split documents up into individual words and punctuation symbols, so we can carry out the same kinds of analysis we did with text corpora in earlier chapters? How can we write programs to produce formatted output and save it in a file? To address these questions, we will cover key concepts in NLP, including tokenization and stemming. Along the way, you will consolidate your Python knowledge and learn about strings, files, and regular expressions. Since there is so much text on the web is in HTML format, we will also see how to handle and process HTML markup. Prepare to dive deeper into the practical aspects of text processing, enhancing your ability to handle a wide variety of text data from different sources. Thank you for joining us in this lecture on Natural Language Processing with NLTK. We hope you found the content informative and engaging. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more insightful tutorials and lectures on NLP and other exciting topics in data science and machine learning. If you have any questions or if there's a specific topic you'd like us to cover in future videos, please leave a comment below. We love hearing your feedback and suggestions, and we're here to help you on your learning journey. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next lecture.